Okay, um, Borodar Pau, good morning um, everyone. Kroiso Gunnis e Higid, welcome um, to the um, conference where we will be talking all things um, futures today. Um, I'm Sophie Howe, I'm the Future Generations Commissioner, so as you can imagine, I spend a lot of my time um, thinking about the future. I guess it's something that we all do to varying degrees. Personally, um, you know, I think it can often be challenging in terms of thinking and planning for our future, but I suppose if you think of the, some of the things that we do on a daily basis, we pay into our, our pensions, um, we might be thinking about keeping physically active because we know that that has a long-term uh, benefit to our health in the future. Um, hopefully we might be taking some personal steps to reduce our carbon emissions, particularly, uh, and reduce our plastic uh, usage um, and waste in particular, um, particularly because of some of the ways in which that's been highlighted recently. But there is this kind of question um, where as a society, um, you know, as a set of public servants and beyond, I guess, in Wales, um, how well do we actually um, plan for the future? How um, equipped are we to be thinking um, and planning for the future? Because obviously much of the um, things that we do today will have a significant impact on the tomorrows um, that our future generations um, experience. Um, and when we see things like one of the most damning IPCC reports to date, which was published last year, um, with experts claiming that we have 12 years to limit the extent um, of the global catastrophe, um, we have to question, really, um, I, and, and I suppose we have to reflect on how poor um, our predecessors actually have been in terms of planning for the future. And of course, you know, I always quite like that Donald Rumsfeld quote, you know, there are the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and the, what is it, known, unknown, known knowns, whatever it is. I never, I, I love it, but I never get it right. Um, but, you know, some of these significant issues that we're facing, climate change is a known known. It is, you know, it is coming. Um, we've known it's coming for a long, a long time, and yet have we taken um, the action to really address it? Still, are we taking the action that we need to address it? Not, in, not according to a number um, of experts. We're nowhere near taking um, the level of ac uh, action to to address that within the next uh, 12 years. But there are broader issues as well. So we know that 92% of the UK population will be living in cities by 2030. How are we planning for that? What does that mean for our um, you know, large, large numbers of um, people in rural communities in Wales? Um, we know that um, around 35% of jobs could be lost to automation, what does that mean in terms of how we need to be responding at the moment? Are we just going to sit back um, and allow that to happen and in a few years' time um, think, oh dear, what's happened? We've got lots of people who are unemployed. Or are we actually going to start questioning our economic model, what it is we value? Actually, could we use automation as a way to enable people to lead um, better lives, lives which are more focused on their own well uh, well-being, community well-being, um, and so on. And I often think that, you know, we tend to sort of sit back and then be um, surprised by the decisions that we take. So I don't know how many of you um, travelled here by, um, you know, from other parts of Wales on the uh, the train this morning and might have come through Cardiff. I hope that there were a number of you at least who, um, who did that. But what you will see um, across the streets of Cardiff are, you know, significant numbers of rough sleepers. Um, and there's this almost sort of societal outrage now. Oh gosh, how did this happen? And actually, what we can do is to track back um, probably to the last 10 years, um, and I'm not going to be political because I am politically um, neutral, but we can track back those um, policy decisions which have probably um, led to what we're seeing on the streets of Cardiff now. Um, I think that there are some significant um, challenges in terms of getting our public sector to meet the new obligations under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in terms of this futures thinking. Um, it's not been something that has been resourced here in Wales. Um, there is quite a tiny team um, in Welsh Government who um, do futures. There's, you know, other... Um, other advisors like the chief scientific advisor and so on but actually if you said to any private sector 
uh, company with a turnover of £15 billion. We've got a handful of people thinking about the future. They would laugh you out of this room. And, you know, for any of our public sector organisations that we're running, if we haven't got that significant focus on long-term planning and long-term futures, um, we're not just uh, not complying with uh, the requirements of the Future Generations Act, but we are letting um, future generations down. So today, I think, is a real opportunity to share um, some of the thinking around um, approaches to futures, um, some of the techniques that are being used here in Wales and um, internationally um, to think and plan for the future. This is, I think, you know, a bit of a, a start in terms of a conversation. Um, clearly, what I've seen from wellbeing assessments from public bodies setting their wellbeing objectives and PSB setting their wellbeing plans is that there's been a stab at trying to do that kind of foresight um, and, and future trends and scenarios and building that into um, wellbeing objectives and wellbeing plans. But I can clearly see that, um, you know, the capacity is quite, um, is quite limited. So today really is trying to help to build that capacity. Um, I'd be delighted to hear feedback um, at the end of the day as to whether it's been useful and what other things would be useful. Different PSBs and different uh, public bodies are taking um, varying approaches. Some are not taking any approaches um, at all, and that's really quite worrying. But um, welcome to today. We've got some fantastic um, speakers. I'm not going to um, uh, say any more other than to um, tell you, because I can see a chief fire officer in the room, that there are no fire alarms um, planned and the fire exits um, are, well, there and uh, down there. Um, but without further ado, hopefully, um, seeing as we are all things future and um, a digital future um, is, you know, is absolutely um, certain, um, I'm hoping that the um, technology will work. And I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Henk um, Hilderink. Now, Henk is a senior researcher at RIVM, leading several projects in the field of population health and the environment. His research is focused on integrated population and health projections and scenarios at national, European and global scales, mainly in the context of sustainable the development. Public Health Foresight Study 2018 shows how public health... Right. Okay. There we are. It was ahead of itself, in fact. So um, I think Henk is with us. So um, welcome to Dr. Henk um, Helderink. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Maybe get some feedback on that. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Very good morning to you from the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to give you a short presentation about uh, the foresight and policy making. Actually, in the Netherlands, we have some experience in the field of public health foresight studies. And I'm going to take you uh, along that path of experience. But first of all, why do we want to have foresight studies? And it was just mentioned, the future is rather uncertain, but it is very worth and necessary also to explore what kind of uncertainty are we facing? And especially because we have many societal future challenges ahead of us. And we want to uh, grab a little bit what kind of uncertainty is, can we uh, identify around those future challenges. And of course, we want to do that to anticipate on undesirable trends and changes that might happen in, in the future. Climate change was mentioned, but we have many more trends that might be bended to a more desirable uh, direction. And of course, that may, it's making the link to policy making. Policy making is always about the future. So uh, the foresight study should be helpful to also as an input for the policy making process. And of course, the last point is also stated today to be together to promote discussion about future trends and also that in, in such a way uh, to improve decision making. But first, if we look at the future, we have many different images of the future. We have many different trends that we are facing. So the question is how to deal with all these different ideas, these tr different trends that we are facing. And first of all, if you look at the future, then the, uh, if we go from the present to the future, then the number of the possible futures is the range is rather big but you can make a distinction in what kind of futures can you distinguish in the, that future 
first of all, the forecast is maybe the most common used, like the weather forecast. It's the likely future, the one in the middle. But also we have the scenario thinking that you have A, B, C, and D. That those can be different futures. But what we see the last, let's say, five to 10 years, that there's much more thinking about also not only scenarios, but more about what kind of desirable futures could we distinguish in that whole range of possible futures. So actually, and that brings along that you can look at uncertainty. I mentioned it already. You can look at uncertainties uh, along two dimensions. First of all, we have rather limited knowledge about the future. So we have, and you can call that also the cognitive uncertainty. So economic growth always mentioned as something rather difficult to assess, but also technological process, uh, progress, but also geopolitical changes. Those are all, we have limited knowledge about how that will evolve in the future. But the other dimension is becoming more and more important, especially I would say in the public sector. That is, let's say the normative uncertainties. And that's much more, maybe even more important is not the econ economic growth, if it's 1% or 2%, may but maybe more important is what kind of future do we want? What kind of future do we desire? And there we also see that there are many different ideas about what we value most. And to, to start a discussion about that might be very important. And especially what I said, that the normative aspects in the public sector might be one of the most as, uh, important dimensions of uncertainty. Another point, of course, with uncertainty is what kind of time horizon are we looking at? And that, of course, depends on the issues at hand. If we look at climate change, then it's, uh, let's say, 2100 is, is a rather normal time horizon. But for the issues at stake, let's say in the public sector or public health, then we can see a time horizon that is a little bit closer by is much more uh, common. But even there, we, you can make a distinction. Uh, less than five years, policymakers really want to have a certain kind of scenario studies within the coming five years, because that's the period actually of their mandate. However, uh, five to, but that is more or less about current policy uh, only. Five to 10 years, you're talking about current policy makers. 10 to 30 years, it's much more the strategic level and uh, more than 30 years, then you're talking about visionary, scenario, uh, visionary scenarios. And those have a very inspirational kind of purpose. But what we are focusing on within the public health foresight study is actually the more strategic part. And that's something that we are doing for 25 years already. We do it every four years. Uh, the first edition was in 1993, and last year in June, we published the seventh edition. And we took a time horizon in 2040, and that's a rather strategic kind of time horizon, Very sometimes very difficult also to explain to the policymakers why you should look at such a, a long time horizon, because 25 years ahead is for policymakers rather difficult to link to their policies. However, if you make the point that to achieve somewhere in 2040, you might start thinking about that, how to achieve that uh, future. You might uh, think about that already now and put policies in place already now. Uh, so uh, what we are doing also is the, with the public health foresight study to, to use it as an input for the national and the local health policy. I will show you a little bit later on that one. Uh, and uh, we are doing this for 25 years. Uh, 25 years ago, the first one was completely a paper version, but nowadays it's only uh, digitally. We have a small brochure on paper, but the rest is uh, all available uh, on the website. And most of it is also available in English. To position actually, how does it work? We have uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the Act on Public Health Policy. So we have the four year cycle. That's the four years that we produce the report and that's being used in the uh, policy cycle. So we produced uh, last June, uh, our uh, foresight study. And that's more or less the problem definitions or agenda setting part of the policy cycle. Now the ministry is formulating a document with the uh, prior priorities for their policies and they're trying to also translate it to the local policy makers. In the next step, you have the policy implementation and 
uh, the third step is the evaluation. And uh, as an outcome of the evaluation, we produce again a foresight uh, report in four years of time. Now, we produced uh, in 2018 uh, uh, the, the public health foresight study. And the way we did that, we, uh, we've we, we more or less uh, developed a trend scenario. You could see that as a business as usual scenario. And the main question there was, what are we facing in the coming 25 years if current can, uh, trends continue and no new policies are implemented? So it's not a future that is very likely to occur because new policies will be put in place, but it gives an idea about what kind of challenges might be, we be facing. And we do that in a quantitative part. So we look at risk factors like smoking, uh, lifestyle, uh, uh, the overweight, uh, alcohol use, but also the, the air pollution. We look at disease burden, uh, health expenditures. So we, we have ma many quantitative indicators that uh, we project for the coming 25 years, but also not all of the, the relevant elements for the future are can be uh, quantified. We also have qualitative uh, explorations of the future, and especially if you look at technology and healthcare demand, that is much more a qualitative description of the future instead of the quantitative. With that trend scenario, we are describing about 100 relevant trends for the future. And what we did is to uh, have a survey among citizens, health professionals, and students to identify the major societal challenges. And they valued in their way what uh, is important for, from their point of view for the future. Of course, we did not only use that survey, we also used policy reports. We want to be as policy relevant as possible. So but we identified three uh, societal challenges. I will uh, tell about a little bit more about that later. And we defined then options for actions. What could we, would, what can we do about these challenges and who should do what? And uh, these days it's only the whole process of making such a, doing such a study is with stakeholders from the beginning onwards. So it's from policy, practice and research. Just to give you an idea about what we are doing, we have a one and a half minute video. I don't know if I'm gonna show it or if you're gonna do it over there. Maybe I can try it to see how it works. The Public Health Foresight Study 2018 shows how public health in the Netherlands will develop if we continue down the current path without change. The prospects for future public health in the Netherlands are good. Nevertheless, we face some major future challenges. Here, we highlight a few of these challenges. An aging population means the number of elderly people will increase. An increasing number of elderly people will live alone at home. Healthcare will become more complex. In the future, more people will suffer from chronic diseases such as dementia, cancer, and cardiovascular diseases. Healthcare for these people will change as a result of technological developments because patients will increasingly do more themselves. These developments will increase the pressure of the informal care providers. We also experience threats from the city life, flexible working people. Young people feel more and more pressure to perform. To deal with the complex challenges we are facing, we need to develop a new way of working. We need to collaborate more and the focus should be on people's personal situations. This also means that we need to look beyond the borders of public health and healthcare. A healthy living environment, school and workplace are vital for a healthy future. So we need to develop a new way of working. Fortunately, professionals and organisations have already started to do this. We can build on these experiences. A healthy prospect. I hope the video was uh, clear. It's not always going right, but I, I at least here it worked well. But uh, just to focus a little bit more on those uh, three major societal future challenges we identified for the ministry, uh, we see that the high disease burden of cardiovascular diseases and cancer will still be high. So uh, it's not only a matter of prevention, but also dealing with the consequences of these diseases in the longer term. 
uh, especially with cancer treatments, we see now that ex-patients have a lot of difficulties with uh, working uh, situations, but also uh, with uh, having a contract for their insurance company. The second one is that we see that with the aging of the population, people are living longer independently at home, and they are facing also many more uh, chronic diseases. Uh, dementia is a very important one, but also other complex problem, uh, problems we see among those people. And the third one is the mental pressure on teenagers and young adults. And I'm very happy, happy that we also have mental health now as a, one of the, uh, the three uh, challenges. That is something that we couldn't quantify too much, but we could, got all kinds of signals from stakeholders that this is really something that is more or less uh, uh, being identified as being one of the challenges, not only now, but especially in the future. And in all these three challenges, the vulnerable groups are put at a central place. Just to conclude some lesson, lessons learned from uh, the, especially the last public health foresight study, and that might also be important for you for the day. And what we can see is the challenges that we are facing are complex. And to, in order to deal with those challenges, it, it requires an integrated approach. Not only, it's uh, not only a concern of public health, but also of education, also of all kinds of social aspects play a role. And uh, what we should also more do is the person in a central position. So the personal approach is rather important there. Secondly, is that we see also many, op uh, many uh, opportunities to deal with the challenges in technology. Of course, te technology has the potential of, of achieving a lot, but the, the main question there is how to put it in place in, in a way that it really works. And the local living environment can also provide many opportunities to deal with uh, what uh, with the challenges. And for example, the, the old people living longer alone, having a, an old dementia friendly living environment might work a lot there. And last point is very important also for ourselves that we can see that these kind of uh, complex issues uh, uh, require also a different way of working. And what we can see is policymakers, uh, they have to adapt to that but not only uh, policy makes also professionals, what we can see, the uh, research and citizens, they all have to look beyond their silos and to see where the opportunities lay in the other domains. That was our experience from the Netherlands about the public health foresight study. And I hope this is a nice start for you for the day. very much, Henk. I'm not sure if we've got any, let me just check the time ends, whether we've got any time for questions. Maybe one or two. We don't really, but if anyone's desperate to ask a question. No? Okay. Henk, can I thank you very much then for, for joining us and your, um, your really insightful presentation. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.